Well, hello. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are going to be talking about a case that's coming up on the Supreme Court's docket. It's called Moore versus United States. It's about a $14,000 tax bill. And uh, the world is uh, kind of coming apart over this. There's an incredible amount of uh, angst that the Supreme Court might rule in favor of the taxpayers on their $14,000 claim. And it's attracting so much attention. And um, it's been going on a while. We've been covering it a, a bit on this channel. Um, and we've discussed some of the possibilities of uh, a lot of uh, people, the ac academics and people of media outlets, they're all on the same page. They're all saying this thing, if the Supreme Court rules in the Moore's favor, all heck is going to break loose, ladies and gentlemen. It's all going to end the U.S. tax code as if that would be a bad thing. But there is absolutely um, there are people falling apart. And what's interesting is I've noticed uh, as as we get I want to uh, we'll get to my get to to our valuable guests in a second here, but I want to just give you a a, a really uh, a great viewpoint of what I'm seeing going on. There's this this effort this effort to get everybody uh, freaked out uh, that the Supreme Court might rule against uh, uh, the government, and this is something that came up here. I, I saw this uh, on uh, well, and I'm going to ask uh, John. You're not going to believe this. But there might be a, a, an effort. Um, uh, there might be an effort uh, to uh, try to to uh, persuade people and freak them out, and also lay the groundwork. This is what's interesting. Here it is. This is what I've noticed. There's been this incredible effort to lay the groundwork to destroy the credibility of uh, Justice Alito and um, Justice Thomas. Um, and it's right here. This was a, this was actually an opinion piece in my local paper, the New Haven Register. And wouldn't you know it, this, this opinion piece is repeating the same exact lines we've been hearing from all the people who say, oh my goodness, this, this the repeal of this transition tax would be awful. They all say, oh, the, the Supreme Court should do it, but if justice and, and, and the, the Supreme Court should uphold it, but if it's not, it's because Justice uh, Alito and, and, and Clarence Thomas, they're both unethical because they take um, right here, this is, is how dare they accept hundreds of thousands of dollars by some estimates, millions of dollars of travel, food, lodging and other support and splendor from their wealthy sponsors. Such over the top indulgence reeks of privilege does, that does not fit comfortably with their roles in the egalitarian Democrat society. I guess that's what this writer believes we have here. And this is uh, somebody named uh, uh, this is on the New Haven Register. This is Gerald Kahn. And he's writing this completely spontaneous uh, opinion piece that just happens to coincide with the exact opinions of those academics. So, John, are you surprised by this uh, at all? Uh, is this something that the, my great guest, John Richardson, joining us from Parts Unknown? Are you in Canada today or are you in Parts Unknown, sir? No, I, I'm in Parts Unknown. And I've been, sorry for my uh, unseen, more than usually unseemly appearance. I've been sick for the last week. Oh, no. I just reemerged only to be on IRS Medic there today. You know. The power. There it is. Glad to hear. All right. Uh, so your question uh, was what? Am I surprised by this? Are you surprised? That, I mean, I mean, look, you know, uh, New Haven's known as, you know, is, is basically a Yale town. I'm probably. Just no, sure not at all. Especially given the fact that it's, you know, that it's coming from, uh, you know, one of the bastions of sort of Ivy Leagueness, et cetera. Mm. Any of the yeah. fancy intellectuals of the world. That's no, I'm not, I'm not surprised by this at all. In fact, well, you know, I think that when you look at all the media coverage on this, which is, you know, so completely idiotic, I mean, I think one might ask a simple question, and that is this. Let's assume for the moment that everything that they say about Alito and Thomas are true, that they're corrupt, they're horrible individuals, they're walking excuses for the sterilization of their parents, you know, wh whatever these people you know, would like to say, but all that notwithstanding, let's assume that's true for a minute. I want to ask a very simple question. Would you rather have a world ruled by the Internal Revenue Code or a world where un supposedly unprincipled people like Justices Alito and Thomas have the chance to protect people from the Internal Revenue Code? Anthony, which would you rather have? Yeah, I would want that protection. I don't care what their motivations are. As long as you're striking down on constitutional things, I'm okay with it. I um, think that's absolutely yeah. right. Part of the problem with the discussion here, and this comes particularly, I'll use the phrase pension intellectuals again, particularly from these people 
is they don't seem to understand that the role of the Supreme Court is a neutral arbiter and the decision should be made in accordance with the Constitution. You never hear these people raise the question whether well, there's any possibility at all of a retroactive tax going back 30 years on income that wasn't even yours, never even discussion of that, or whether that just might not meet the requirements of the 16th Amendment of the Constitution. Rather, what they do is they say, oh my God, look, it's before the Supreme Court and Justices Alito and Thomas, well, I think they've sent it to Roberts now because he has shares in some some one of these companies. You know, well, people yeah. out of the court. Well, if you're looking to discredit Justice, I mean, if you're looking to discredit the Supreme Court, well, Justice Roberts flew to Epstein Island. He's on there. So why don't you bring that up? I'm why are you why do you need to reach for something that okay, well, they're all kind of doing it. It's interesting that you're just pick, picking Justice Alito and Clarence Thomas. I mean, not mentioning the fact that if you go to Congress, you become fabulously wealthy. Diane, Diane Feinstein somehow became a, a hundreds of millions of dollars on that modest little salary she was making in the Senate. Um, not mentioned there. Not mentioned. That's not mentioned. But uh, Justice Alito and Clarence Thomas. So I mean, certainly there's. I mean, there's so much. Uh, uh, you know, there's so much uh, fraud going around Washington D.C. So it's sort of odd to pick on these two out of all people. Um, I think the point, issue here yeah. is this. All right. To some extent, all everybody involved in this process is either completely unprincipled or some, you know, or, or self-interest. Let, let's just assume that for a minute. The problem is that the critics of Justice Alito and Thomas, and by the way, they go after Charles Moore as well. What's this scumbag, you know, 14,000? I mean, what is he doing? You know, where does he get the temerity to not just pay this tax, right? You know, this is the view of the pension intellectual, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think the question is, right, you know, what is the right, which level of being unprincipled would you rather deal with? I mean, if we're dealing with the critics, the ones who don't want the Moore case heard, the ones who uphold the transition tax, I mean, they're by far, by far the most unprincipled in the sense of what actually matters, which is whether this thing is constitutional or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they, they seem to have just have simply hijacked the media. I mean, you know. All right. That's what yeah. we see, you know, from from that. I mean, we've seen it in The Guardian. We've seen it. Uh, we've seen these articles uh, all over in uh, multinational uh, companies down to the New Haven Register, down to the New Haven Register. They're, they're getting this message all out there. So now before we get too much in what's going to happen, I want to touch base with Keith Redmond, our, our resident lay person, because, uh, John, you and I are attorneys. And so sometimes you and I could sort of go off and uh, talk about things, um, you know, out there in attorney land um, and not really helping the actual person. So Keith provides us a valuable uh, uh, um, tool here. He keeps us on track. So Keith, I want to open it up to you. What are people asking about the transition tax? What are they concerned about with this? Well, I think, you know, and, and you guys are very passionate and you speak very well and outline the uh, situation. But what I get from time to time is, well, what does that mean for me? And for, as you know, I deal with Americans overseas, okay? So, and it could affect other people as well. But when it comes to Americans overseas who have those small to medium-sized businesses and who are, you know, suffering from the transition tax, whether the more versus the United States goes one way or the other, what does that mean for them on the ground? and their livelihood and their business and what they need to do and not do with the transition tax, how will it affect them? Just to kind of bring it down into everyday speech, if you will, if that makes sense. All right, well, I think that's what I get. Well, I think, Keith, thank you for that question because uh, while, you know, because I, this is the reality that if more is upheld, there's not gonna be, you know, there's not, it, the, the transition tax won't affect you if it hasn't affected you already. So, so, and I would say that that's a really good question to ask because while John and I are freaking out over this, and I think everybody should be freaking out over this, we're not freaking out over it because it's going to institute a, there's going to be a new tax bill on a transition tax uh, for people, but rather just the 2017 transition tax that hit people is just upheld and ratified. 
so that's 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 the uh, that is the the practical impact of it. What will right. this mean? Is the practical that the, the transition tax upheld? But it doesn't mean that there's going to be um, it's it's going to be enforced for you know your built up EMP from 2017 to 20, 2000, uh, uh, 2023 is going to be uh, upheld. And I just want to just quickly so mention that's how, what, yeah. so that's if if more is upheld, more is that upheld, will yeah. be the case. Okay. Yeah. Now, now here's what's interesting, and this is what I don't know, is that uh, the IRS is cute. You know, the, the government's cute. Um, and this is how you know it's nothing that we would ever vote for. None of us would ever vote for this. And this is all, you know, basically we've been lied into something. So so if you uh, owe the IRS, if you don't file a tax return, the IRS has forever to assess you, forever to assess you. OK, now, if you uh, the IRS takes money of yours and isn't entitled to it, you have a limited amount of time to uh, get that money. You have three years from the date uh, that the return was filed or two years from the date of payment to get a refund. So what I'm really curious about, and this is really what I would hope is in the court's relief, because I would imagine the Moors have paid it over three years ago and over two years, um, even though they have a pendency, is that, well, what's going to happen to all the people who mistakenly paid this? And I could see the government um, claiming, oh, no, 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 um, you, uh, uh, you're, you missed your time for a refund. However, and, and John might be able to help me on this one, um, I believe a, a suit in the federal court of claims uh, would be appropriate because the basis for their collection was completely illegal. Um, so I'd, I would imagine uh, something like that would happen. Uh, I, I don't think the IRS on its own initiative would uh, just go and refund everybody this uh, for transition tax they should not have paid. Uh, John, what are your feelings on that? I don't really have any feelings on it. Uh, I mean, I certainly agree with your sentiment, uh, you know, that I'm sure they're not, they wouldn't be anxious to do any refunds. Um, you know, I mean, I suppose if the tax is unconstitutional, then it was incorrectly, it never should have been assessed. Okay. And therefore, you know, I mean, I would think they'd probably be successful at the end of the day, but what I think is more likely to happen is that uh, the people who are paying on installments will just walk and breathe a sigh of relief and wanting bother raising is what I think is more likely to happen. Yeah. Yeah. A lot okay. of people are paying on that eight year installment. So, you know, that's what we're going to see. And I think, you know, the larger, and, you know, the larger the transition tax, that's something that, you know, you'll have more of an incentive to go for it. But, you know, that w I don't expect the IRS to say, oh, oopsie, let's give everybody their money back. No, they like to hold on and they like okay. to just. Well, like it was heavily back and loaded. I if I'm not mistaken, the last two years is when like 50 percent of that is payable or something. Right. Uh, again, I don't have this in front of me, but. Practically speaking, I think a lot of people will just, you know, assuming that the decision comes down in their favor, will just breathe a sigh of relief and walk. So my next question, obviously, is if more is not upheld, what would that look like? Would it be just the status quo? No, the other way around. If more is upheld, you mean? No, no. Well, you, Anthony just said that if more is upheld, and he explained it as far as the transition yeah. tax and so forth. So let's say it goes against more. Mind you, well, we're coming at it from a layperson, so maybe I'm not using uh, the right well, word. Well, that's that's well, that's what today's talking. topic is about. You've talked about today's perfect segue. Here we oh, go. good. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay. Here it is. So I happen to have a slide it, just for that. So I have, a, yeah. So uh, I have some slides. Of, uh, these are prepared from John's notes. Um, so John uh, pre presented, uh, created uh, some slides to go over what happens if more is upheld. Okay. So that means if if the the status quo is is there and all the pension or the the intellectuals get their way and the, the mass media and the globalists all get their way and that this critical tax is upheld and the Moors are required to pay that fourteen thousand dollars, what happens to everyone else? Now, John, what you say here? The Supreme Court will have to well, her. Yeah. You know, I thought about this. I threw this together very quickly last night and tried to break it into various categories. Um, first of all, this is not about the transition tax. It's not about more. Okay, at all. All right. If this thing is upheld, they're really upholding, I think, you know, three three general, general principles here, right? I mean, let's just pause before we get into this discussion today. And for listeners, I would like to ask you this question. If... A retroactive tax for 30 years based on income you never received but received by somebody else can be attributed to you 
and you have to pay a present day tax on that. I mean, it makes me wonder what would be a possible limitation on taxation? I mean, I'm having trouble right. even making anything up, right? Yeah. You know, so the first problem I, th I think is that, that um, you know, the first thing is the court has confirmed, and this I'm being a very minimalistic here, okay? The court would have confirmed, first of all, there's no requirement to personally receive income, okay, in the sense of it being realization, okay? At a minimum, you don't have to have received it. Somebody else can have received it. There can it can be out there, but nobody's received it. You don't have to receive it. Okay, that's the first point. Well, right? John, if I could just and, and just and I would say just to, to clarify for all you, you you tax nerds out there, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, Glenshaw's glass would be final coffee. That that that, that test for income is gone. It's gone. That's the longstanding test for income that you know has been whittled away at um, because the IR, you know because the IRS is allowed to go after things that are definitely not realized income and we see that in subpart F in the guilty tax. So, so Andrew, the final death in the Glenshaw gas is shattered. How about that? There you go. There's a metaphor for you. I like um, that Glenshaw glass shattered. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting about Glenshaw glass though is this. Okay. Um, so the government's brief will be out, and I think in a week or so on this, I would expect them to be discussing Glenshaw Glass. But Glenshaw Glass says something to the effect of, they use the fact that the income, that was the uh, punitive damages case, I think, wasn't it, right? There, it was, they used the fact that income was, was clearly realized to justify his income. However, all right, that's confusing the difference between a necessary and a sufficient condition, right? If you think carefully, to say that the fact that if you have it, if if, it, if you have realization, there was income, does not actually mean that if you don't have realization, there's not income. Okay, if you read it carefully. So we'll see on that. Okay, we'll see. But if this is upheld, clearly uh, there's there's no realization requirement in the sense that you have to have anything in your hot little hands. The second thing that I think will be clear is that there could not be any limitation on attributing income received by somebody, by person A to person B, right? In other words, you know, your neighbor across the street, you know, could have a, a hugely high income, say a $10 million income one year, but he's a Democrat and the Democrats, you know, want to take care of their own. So they pass a law saying the Republican across the street has to pay the tax on that income, right? Even though he never received it or vice versa, perhaps. Right. But my point well, is, well, actually, I, I would say this, it, it would actually be like, no, no, the, the Democratic across the street pays the taxes, but also the Republican has to pay, pay them as well. Um, because that's okay, more or less well, what it is. Because, we'll because well, because, because, you know, and, and this is what, it, this is the, this is the mechanism um, by, by which it works is that, you know, your corporate EMPs is a, is a corporation's asset. It doesn't belong to the shareholders other than they have the equity in it, but the actual exact property isn't there. In order to get that property, there would have to be a distribution or a fist forced dissolution of the company. If there's a forced dissolution of the company, the equity is probably, uh, is blown up. Um, and if, if, if it's a distribution, well, that means somebody had to agree to give it, which, you know, in this case, the transition that it was never given. So those are really the things is that, that the, that the shareholder is taxed on something that isn't really theirs. Uh, sure. In, in an indirect portion, they may get some of that, but there's no guarantee or right they have. Uh, to the, a one-to-one, -one, okay, the earnings and profits are this much of the company. Okay, let's take a pro rata share. Okay, this is really what's yours. No, 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 no. The value of what you have is, is the value of your share. And so that's that's how they're double counting everything. And I think that's the real significance of this is that, it, it, you know, the, and the corporation pays all its taxes. And now the shareholder has to pay the corporation's taxes too. So that's why I'm, I'm just sort of describing the analogy a little bit. Yeah, there's that, yeah, there's that problem too. But I mean, to keep it incredibly simple, what, what the decision will mean is that you can be taxed on income received by somebody else, you know, with all these other variants. But I mean, that, that's the second thing it means. The third thing it means, and I think that this is potentially the most dangerous, is I don't think there could be any limitation on retroactivity at all. Yeah. Yeah, right. Anything, anything. Oh, well, geez. Well, here's here's a comment from Suzanne. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Thanks for joining us today. This is upheld. What will stop them from passing more retroactive taxes? Nothing. It will enable them. It will enable them. Right. So, and that's, yeah. 
Just pausing on that for a second, going back to Keith's question about how this affects overseas people. Um, I want to add something to your, to your answer, Anthony, and it's this, okay? You know, if we keep this more general, by upholding the legitimacy of this kind of taxation and recognizing this, that through citizenship taxation, the U.S. exports its tax system to other countries, what this clearly will mean is that the U.S. will be entering other countries, creating taxable events, fake income events, and siphoning revenue out of those countries. Which, you know, which really, I think, you know, for all these people, these Americans there who smugly think, well, I'm American or something like that. I think that they're, this will, you know, begin the process of rethinking whether countries can have Americans living in them. I mean, yeah. imagine, imagine if by letting an American into the country, you're setting the country up for base erosion because they have to comply with these fake income laws, right? You know, take a, you know, or even uh, unfake income laws, take the sale of a house, right, a principal residence. Well, you know, it's tax policy in a lot of countries that people ought to be able to keep that to reinvest into another house, right? I mean, governments have an interest in housing stability for their, for their residents. So the U.S. comes along and says, sorry, buddy, but you're a U.S. person. We're simply going to take that money out of the country, okay? I mean, no country can put up with this, right, which means that because the, the U.S. exports its citizenship tax to regime to other countries, it really means that I think the countries have got to think long and hard about whether they can afford the risk of having U.S. citizens living there. That's a great question. You know, a country's tax base is what the you know, or, you know, value of the corporations or corp corporations that are domiciled there, part of their tax base. And, you know, really what this transaction transition tax is saying, like, no, 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 that's that belongs to the U.S. tax base because exactly. you're the conduit of the shareholder. So that's exactly what it is. You know, and as we're talking and this is just, just you know, more is so mind is so off. It, you know, that this whole transition tax, it's so bad. I mean, and, and depraved is the word. Um, it's it's a, it's hard to imagine that anybody in the world would defend this. It really is. It's it's really hard to imagine anybody in the world defending it. But well, come on, are... look to the law schools. Look to the law schools. The professors. Mm. They're going the into professors. overdrive. Read tax notes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. The, and law professors and journalists are all the same. You're entitled to make as much money as they are, but you dare go over a cent what they make. Well, they're going to come and come up with great law review articles about why you shouldn't have that and belongs to everyone else. It's it's amazing. Um, Here's a question. Yeah, go ahead. If Keith. I may. Yep. Just based on everything that you guys are talking about today and over the past couple of weeks with the more versus the United States, mm -hmm. is that if you are and if you are an American overseas and you have that small to medium sized business that can be adversely affected by the transition tax and you have yet to enter the U.S. tax system. Where is the incentive in doing so? Oh, my God, right? Maybe yeah. you guys can't answer that question, or you particularly, Anthony, can't answer it with the work that you do. But it is a legitimate question. You know what I mean? Where is the incentive? Or is it better to just say, whew, boy, did I avoid all that. I'm just going to keep moving forward with what I'm doing. Mm. Mm. Well, why do you always ask the question, where's the incentive? How is there an, an, an if you well, the word incentive, how is there an incentive to ever be in any tax system? Uh, you, you ask a good question, and maybe let's see, yeah. where's the incentive? Because you know, I feel, and it's just a feeling, and it's just based on the years I've been doing this stuff, is that I think you know the IRS tries to incentivize people in coming clean. With the OVDP, the Streamline Program, et cetera, there's some incentive to coming in and maybe waiving some penalties and interest, okay? So that's where I come up with the incentive. Because isn't the objective here to try to get as many Americans overseas into the tax system as possible? So if that is the case, where is the incentive for doing so? The transition tax certainly is not an incentive. In doing so, do you yeah, see no. what I mean? No, no. The uh, the transition tax is is you know a warning, and it's a warning to say this is how insane you know uh, the tax right. code is going to be. This is what can be passed, and this is what um, the media is going to line up 
and academia is going to line up to defend tooth and nail. So that's a great question, Keith. Um, really, you know, that'd be a question for, you know, perhaps um, someone who's supposed to be accountable to answer, but uh, we don't get a lot of that, do we? Um, yeah, so that's, I just throw yeah. it out there because it's no, something I, that e each person needs to think about for their own yeah. personal and emotional well-being. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So anyway. it's something that you want to, you know, right. It's, it, you want to definitely think about that. Um, now, uh, we're moving on to the next slide. You have some things here. We might have talked about some of these things here. Um, it's going to validate all these fake income events that we talked about. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and that's, I think, you know, the single biggest problem here, right? Uh, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to basically embolden them, you know, to, oh, my God. I mean, all they have to do is look around and, and say, Jesus, God, I see that somebody has something here. Let's figure out a way to take it. Uh, you know, they're certainly going to do that. And by the way, let me just pause here, okay? I know that the, uh, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court is, you know, probably not in its best days in terms of public perception and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, my God, uh, you know, the, this particular Supreme Court is the only thing that stands between the American people and any possibility of freedom going down the road. Which really brings you to the, the I mean, they're really going all out on this one. Again, uh, they're going all out with these personal attacks against the Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, because they don't seem to have, you know, they don't have a lot of uh, legal justification for this whatsoever. No, it's, uh, it's, just, it's not even that, Anthony, it, it, although it would include that. OK, it's who they are. These people, they're absolutely base. They are completely unprincipled. Right. In, in the sense that not only are they completely unprincipled, but they're so unprincipled that they can't even identify the right principle they don't want to apply to the facts. I mean, th I mean, this is shocking. I mean, you could write, you know, I, there's a great political science professor who's dead now. Um, and I think he ended his career at the University of Chicago. Interestingly, he was at the University of Toronto back in the Stone Age when I was there. He wrote a book called The Closing of the American Mind. His name was Alan Bloom. He was actually a Plato scholar. But boy, you know, it's just, this is like, you know, history will look back at this. You could use that as an example of the complete inability of the academic world, the mainstream media, to, you know, actually look objectively, you know, at what's going on here. But anyway, so much, so much for that. I, I, well, I, and, and I would say this, that, you know, this, this is going to be the most popular podcast on, on this topic, right? It will. And we'll end up with about uh, probably 600 views overall. Um, so that's sort of the frightening thing is that we're talking about one of the most, we're, we're really talking about uh, the most important Supreme Court case heard, I don't know what. I don't know when, and it's it's debatable because what how, what this really means that we're just totally unhinging ourselves. This is a total unhinging from the U.S. Constitution. There is no way that that the transition tax in the, in the Constitution can exist together. One of them has to win, and if more wins, that that's official. Then it's official. The new Constitution, the actual Constitution of the United States of America, is the U.S. tax code. That there's no. no I think that's about a brilliant thought, Anthony. I think that's exactly right. You yeah. know, but I, I think it already is, and I think it already, yeah. And that there's a there's a great there's a great uh, argument for that, and that's I think uh, you know Alejandro's comment here. Where's the outrage in America? Exactly. Exactly. Where is it? Because I, I can tell you, I can't tell you this. I'm in, I'm in Wallingford, Connecticut. And I could walk down the street. And I said, what do you guys think about more versus U.S. And, 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 what? No one would know. No one would know. And I, I could even bring this up with other attorneys. And very few know. Uh, of course, the smart ones who are following this channel, they know all about it. I so let's that. imagine, Anthony, that, um, you know, you look at the history of civilizations. And, you know, as I've said many times, I'm sort of a disciple of Charles Adams, you know, the relationship between the ups and downs of civilization and taxation. But I could imagine uh, a historian a few hundred years down the road uh, writing about the Moore case and the whole situation as, uh, you know, a, a light, if you will, a warning, you know, in terms of the complete decline of American civilization. 
Uh, basically, though, the question contextually what happens if more is upheld, the government moves into straight confiscation mode. Now, yeah. I want to point out here a couple things, right? That, you know, confiscation, not all forms of confiscation are the same, right? You can reach out and just take something from somebody. You can find other ways to do it through the tax system. For example, forced real, forced actual realization events. You know, the uh, Secure Act, for example. You know, that limited the number of years for a payout and inherited uh, Roth IRA or whatever that was. You know, to ten years instead of indefinitely. Right? It was a way of the government confiscating assets. Didn't use the word confiscation, but by forcing the realization, right? You have to take this amount. You know, you have to take it all within 10 years would do that. So, you know, there's going to be more and more of this going on. I think to put it very, very simply, what, what happens if more is upheld is that the backroom discussion of how do we confiscate people's assets ends. It simply becomes a public discussion. As a result of more, the United States government is going to create a commission on how to confiscate the assets of the American people. OK, and, and we know we can do this because more has been upheld and we're going to do this in different ways. We're going to have we're going to have a department of forced realization. We're going to have a department of fake income. We're going to have a department of enhanced reporting requirements. You know, I mean, this is what's going to be going on. Well, you know, what I could imagine. Then there'll be another there'll, there'll be a new taxpayer bill of rights three. Uh, that will be as equally an operative as Taxpayer Bill of Rights 1 and 2. So that, that, that's what we'll also no, get in there, too. No, no, no. There will be a Taxpayer Bill of Rights 3, which will give all of the rights to the government. There you go. There you go. The government has the right to own you. Shut up. Um, well, that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what the U.S. They, they, I mean, and that's 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 the question I pose is, is do, you know, does the government have the right to own us? Because that is really what it is through citizenship-based taxation. Wherever you go, great. We get a cut. Well, I have Whenever you, if you go, if you go get a job on Mars, you go get a job at Mars. Guess what? We get a cut. It's not worldwide taxation. It's actually universal tax taxation. Anywhere in the universe, the IRS gets a cut, um, and that's called ownership. That's called you know that that is a form of slavery. There's no doubt. And who would vote for this? No one ever would. And in fact, we never did. Uh, when you actually look at it, we, we actually never voted for this, but boy, did we get it. Um, so let's move on to the next slide here and let's go. Yeah, on to, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Before yep. we move on to the next slide, I want to I want to extend something you're talking about here a little bit. Yeah. And I think this is worth a separate podcast. All right. You know, the, you know, the case Cook versus Tate. Yes. From 1924 that everybody looks at and says, well, this is the case that legitimizes citizenship taxation. OK, I'm interested so far. Keep going. Okay. Uh, I'll send you something I wrote on this a while ago, but about a year ago, I got sort of rethinking it. And I actually went back and read the case a few times. And although I agree that the case is discussed in the context of taxation, that's not what the decision says at all. At all. What the decision says is basically that U.S. citizens are the property of the U.S. government, therefore the government can do what it wants. Okay, that's what it actually says. Oh, all right. And so, and so because of that, we can tax you? Did it go course, that far to say? Of course. But yes. Yeah. All other right. Words, taxation was not what the case. It was the context, I agree. Okay. Yeah. And it may have been, you know, the final decision in terms of what mattered to people at the time. But the reasoning to get the to the decision. And I really, I'm going to send you this thing I wrote, but read All right, that sounds like we should do that. I think we really should cover that. you me on this. But what the case says, it's written by Justice McKenna. And I'll get to why that's important in a second, okay? But what the case actually says is that he really talks about the relationship between the citizen and the government, right? In the sense of, you know, there's being sort of, uh, you know, the government sort of owns the citizen. Now, I want to point out also, this play takes place in 1924, prior to the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights where individuals had rights. So this decision is taking place completely in the context of a meaning of citizenship where citizens are basically subjects of the government, ownership, etc. And for that reason, this is the reasoning 
at least the way I interpret it, that gets them to the, t- the citizenship taxation is just an afterthought. It's not the point of the, it's the afterthought. Well, look, if a citizen is the property of the government, I mean, look, if you owned a cow, right, and the cow leaves, don't you still have the right to the milk, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's what the decision really is. So it's, it's to, to interpret it as a tax decision, I think it's completely wrong. Now, the other thing that, that is worth noting about this is that McKenna wrote another very important decision on citizenship about 10 years earlier. Um, and I think the case had to do with whether a woman who married an alien would automatically lose their citizenship. But you know, very, very similar stuff. And by the way, during this time period, McKenna had had a stroke. Okay, and He wasn't thinking very clearly, et cetera. So not only do we have the decision taking place in a different time, a different era, with different ideas about what citizenship was, but McKenna was not considered to be, how can I put it, the sharpest knife in the drawer uh, on the Supreme Court. But anyway, that could be a very interesting separate podcast. Okay. I think we got to, I think we got to do that. Yeah. I, th- I, I think that would be awesome to do. I really want to take a deep look at that because that could just be the basis of, you know, the basis of, you know, U S ownership in, you know, the U S the U S the U S uh, government's property rights inherent in each of its subjects. It's uh, that that's be right. a delightful conversation that we really need to get to. That's exactly um, right. All right. Yeah. That, that needs a little bit more attention because most people just, you know, blindly and I'm, Probably, you know, I've read the decision myself. I didn't read it so, as closely as you, so I really would love to go through. Well, it. I didn't read as closely as me either until I read it three or four times. Then I, the reason I started to rethink it was because of. I'll give a shout out to a very, very interesting book by a professor named Amanda Frost, who wrote sort of a history of U.S. citizenship, and you know, went through a lot of these things. It got me sort of you know, rethinking a little bit about, you know, what exactly is this whole citizenship thing. But I will say this, that the U.S. concept of citizenship, uh, in the same way as concept of international tax, is very much rooted in a post-World War I a view of citizenship where, you know, it was really about the rights of the state in, the, in, the, in relation to the citizen and not vice versa. But anyway, next. Yeah, and I would say this too, and you know, just when you said that World War One, it just sort of did make me, you know, made me think. Because I asked my dad yesterday, I said, "Dad, what part of the Constitution gives the government the right to draft people for wars? Where is that? Where do we find that?" And the answer is, we don't. But we know that Lincoln did it uh, because, well, he did a lot of things, and we know that uh, you know there's a draft in World War One as well. Um, but really, there's no real right the government has unless the government thinks it owns everybody and it can press and impress individuals and fighting wars they don't agree with um so i think that's something to to, to, uh you know that that's part of the whole thing if the government doesn't own you how could it force you to fight a war you don't want to fight you know anthony this was very much uh you know you sound very much like uh, the comments made by uh oh i don't like Cassius Clay before he changed his name to Muhammad Ali. So, you know, as you may know, some of the history here, he was, of course, drafted and he refused induction. Uh, But one of the points that he made that I thought was really, really interesting was he said, how in the world, why would I go and fight for the people, the freedom of people in Vietnam when they won't even give me freedom where I live in this country? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think it was, you know, a very, very interesting, very interesting point. Well, the question, who's your real enemy? That's, that's, that is, um, you know, and that's, um, that's, uh, and I see we have some comments that I want to address sort of on that topic, because I think it's like, who is your true enemy here? Right. And, and let's not, and, let, and I think this is what I would say about um, Ali's comments that, you know, you know um, uh, really, really great is that let's, let, let's remove, let, let's assume Let's assume America has racial harmony and what what Muhammad Ali he's talking about has nothing to do with race. But he's really saying, well, how why should I fight for someone else's freedom when I don't have the freedom to participate in this war or not? I don't have the freedom of what you know, like they're going to put me in some unit. They're going to put me something. I'm like they don't give me the freedom of who my commanding officer is. I have some moron who's going to march me off into my sure, sure death. And into misery, and I'm going to be my. I'm going to have blood on my hands because I'm going to be killing people. Maybe I really don't want to. I don't have the freedom not to kill people, and you're going to make me. The, so, so inherently, it's a contradiction. 
If you're being forced to fight for something, you don't have freedom. And so it's all. <laughs> I, I it's think he was a lot more base. I think he was just saying the black people of America don't have freedom. That's all he was. Saying. Which, 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 you know, obviously there, there's some things there, but I'm even going past that. Um, oh, wait, we're still on. Uh, we're still on this slide here. Um, and let me just let me just check in with Keith. Keith, any uh, question what we're doing so any any um confusion so far where you are? You think we're running off the rails a little bit? Are we uh we're keeping it uh for the lay person? Anything you're you're getting hung up on? No, no, I'm not getting hung up on anything right at the moment. Right, I'll interject great. if I do, but no, no, no. It makes sense. All right. Well, um, actually, speaking of Keith here, I think that one of the themes of this of this particular slide is you know how this is all facilitated by the you know the two political party system right you know which is yeah. just from, from one party and i think that i mean the reason okay look i think all of us would agree okay and i think probably every listener would agree that no individual american citizen has any relevance anymore whatsoever in the political process that it's completely been taken over co-opted you know by the two parties and 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 that really i think is the like if say tocqueville were to come back a few hundred years later and write democracy in america he, he'd write a book about the political parties right you know waging war against one another and what has to happen i think gradually is the stranglehold of the political party to be broken and that's why you know i was really excited yesterday i, I mean i, I don't know feelings about this guy personally, but, you know, this uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., um, you know, di you know, disentangling himself from the Democrats and deciding to run as an independent. Like, I think this is really exciting because I think that independents are, the time has come. I think they're absolutely essential. We have this Cornell West guy as well. You know, who's running as an independent. You know, and I got to say, I saw his platform. Oh, my that's Cornell West. I'm like, wow, there's a lot of that. I think a good 80, 90%. I was like, yeah, uh, right on. The only way uh, that an individual can matter is to vote for an independent. And um, I think it'll be interesting. I mean, I think that, you know, virtually all Americans feel like, okay, let me put it this way. A dog knows whether he's been tripped over or deliberately kicked, right? So I think that all individuals realize they're being kicked in the teeth by these political, especially Americans abroad with Democrats abroad running around, vote, 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 you know, like a trained seal or something. Yeah, right. Yeah. Make sure you vote for us. Vote, and, vote, yeah. vote. We're not going to do anything for you except give you like the vote, most embarrassing vote, vote. lip service. Right. And I mean, yeah. it's embarrassing what they're doing. I mean, they, they make an effort to say, we'll reach out to vote for us. We'll make sure we don't do anything helpful for you. And if we ever get close to discussing the topic, we we'll make sure we'll cancel that at the last minute. Um, uh, well, well sure. that's right. But the thing is this. The way that individuals can begin to uh, move democracy in America from a history of the political parties back to the individuals affected, more of a Tocqueville type thing, right, would be to uh, you know, start voting for, uh, you know, independent candidates and making it clear that they won't vote for one of these parties. And as I've said before on this show, I think that the moment is now for Keith and Anthony to launch a ticket as president and vice there president. You there you Can go. There you go. Can use IRS manager for marketing <laughs> platform? There we go. I think, uh, yep. I, I would definitely grants the government at war with you. Absolutely. Whenever the courts are faced, they will... Well, you know my, what? My, my platform will be a D11 dozer. That's what it would be. My platform will be a, the largest bulldozer Caterpillar makes. That's that's going to be my platform. And I'll be headed right to Washington, D.C. That's what I would be doing. Um, exactly. Uh, you know, here's a, here's a comment from, from Johnny Utah. You know, let's be honest, the three branches of government are at war with the American people. Whenever the courts are faced with a decision, they'll rule against the American people every time. And that's pretty much true. So, and that, that's sort of, you know, you know, Johnny Utah, that would, that's sort of why I have hope for this, because if the, if the court was going to do what they're going to do, which is rule against the American people every time, like they typically do. Um, then why are we having this blow up over Alito and Thomas? Why are well, we having this break brouhaha? Why are they so, oh, no, 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 no. They're so panicked about it. And that panic to me is a tell that they know something we don't know, that maybe their spies inside the courthouse kind of know that mm, they're sort of suspect of this transition tax and don't look at it as the greatest thing. 
Um, and not to say, and, and, you know, while, and this is what I would say, while the Supreme Court might rule in the favor of taxpayers on this occasion, overall, the Supreme Court is totally against this because, again, of what John just said, 1924, Tate versus Cook, you are the property of the U.S. government. And that is something all that, you know, state that's not been overruled. So every Supreme Court justice is agreeing with that. And basically what we have is, well, how nice should we be to our slaves? That's what it gets down to. Where's really the economic function? You know, what what um, um, American slavery is, is a, was a unique time and a unique form of slavery, particularly awful. However, there was a limit to how you could mistreat the slaves, because what they would do is if you were truly awful to them is great. Guess what? Who's going to pick your cotton? Guess what? They would just stage workouts. And so there was relief granted in ways to slaves. Essentially, and, and you know, depending on depending on what it is, they would give you time off to go fishing. Um, and if you and you couldn't punish people too much because they would all unite and all make sure you would be po impoverished. Sure, they'd be suffering, but you too as well, as you lose social status, as you lose everything, as your plantation goes nowhere because you're not respecting the people who are picking the cotton. Um, so that's actually how it was, was that there was sort of a you know give and take between that because of the symbio symbiosis between that. So that's the same way I would look at a favorable decision and more is basically, well, yeah, because they don't wanna, they don't wanna kill you so much that you stop working for them. Um, and that's really all it is. And so that's all we're getting out of this is like, maybe they just won't abuse us that much. Um, um, not that it's going to go anywhere. Uh, uh, not, not, not that there's not that any Supreme court justice is truly on our side, Johnny Utah. That's what I would say. I don't really, you know, and I don't think anyone's truly on our side. It's just more of a practical, well, what's good for the government. Is it good for the government to be known as a slave master? You know, you're like, you want to give more of the appearance Oh, you're free. You're free to do what you want, but we're going to get cut every time. If you don't, we're going to put you, you know, in jail. Anthony, another idea for a podcast. Um, do you do you know, uh, you ever read Jerry Spence's writings? Maybe. Jerry yeah. Spence is, well, he's he's fairly old now. Um, anyway, maybe do some Googling on that. This is the language that he uses, right? I mean, he refers to, he's a very famous American trial lawyer. Uh, he refers to the government as the slave master, etc. You know, I'll send you, if you like, uh, some stuff, okay? But very interesting guy. Anyway, moving on here. Uh, so, we, yeah, perhaps we can run next time. So um, what happens for – so, yeah, so the personal. So the Plan B people, the people who kind of came up with other ideas to do, um, you know, these are the people, the second citizenship, the second residence people, probably entering a golden age for them, uh, generally, because there is no, there's no group of people in the world that needs a second citizenship more than American citizens. Simply, yeah, Especially over, if you're overseas, you really need, you know, if yeah. you can get it, do what you can. Um, um, and I know there's some limitations and uh, yeah, if you have money, there's no, you know, you're, you're free, but you're, you're fine. If you're missing that, that's, that's, and that's, isn't that such an irony, right? Wow. Imagine well, that irony. Hey, look, as long as you're wealthy, you're okay. If you're not, oh, uh, well, our, our, our uh, egalitarian. Uh, well, if you're wealthy, is, Anthony, I think probably the United States is not a bad place to be. Right. You know, if you're wealthy, right? It's I mean, great. the wealthy don't have the incentives to move around. It's just that the right. rules are designed to keep people from, frankly, in many cases, I think hardly even surviving. Uh, you know, it's sure. gotten so bad for, for everyday people. Um, when you're given a tax bill for something you didn't get the money for, you can't pay that. that well, yeah, Anthony, so somebody's got to pay it. Somebody's got to pay somebody's it. Gonna I mean, pay. You want to pay it? I mean, you know, come on. I mean, you know, suck it up. Be a good American. Pay, right. pay the tax on somebody else's income. What's the matter with you? What's wrong? I know. What is wrong with me? Oh, I'm just not, I'm, just, I'm not open minded enough, uh, really. Um, the, well, they, uh, all, these, all these preset assumptions, okay? Yeah. You know, open your mind, understand. So now here's, here's America. now, okay, I want to disagree with your next thing you have here, here uh, on response of other countries, because you're saying, you know, Americans have wep uh, are brought our wep weapons of base erosion. Okay, okay, and I'll agree with you on that. And their countries are residents, okay. Sooner or later, this will be understood by all countries and we'll have to respond. That's where I could disagree. That's where I disagree. Sooner or later, this will be understood by countries. 
I don't think they're actually the, the because this is what it is. Just like you know, we might not have voted for the people in America. Um, the things that we vote for might not really have gone that way. Who's to say that the same thing is true in the other countries? And that you know, the the CIA is very proud of the elections it's overthrown. It's very, very proud of, of the, 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 I think it's 89 countries have been overthrown. Um, so you have these countries, well, they're, are, how do we know these, these, these countries aren't basically just appendages of the United States of America? So that's where these people, no, they're not really necessarily taking their orders from their own people, but rather they're taking uh, orders from their government, from their American overlords or their, their globalist overlords. So whether they would realize it, well, that would require a level of intent, uh, intelligence and aptitude because it's so complicated to understand it. And then even if they understand it, that would require them to care. Um, and I don't see, you know, I don't really see a lot of the, the global leaders around the world actually caring all that much about this because that's not necessarily their concern. Um, and let's see. Well, Suzanne, thank you. This is beautiful. Suzanne backing me up here, John. Uh, the rest of the world will now bow to the U.S. every time because of the power the U.S. holds. They want to be considered a friend of the U.S. even. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Even when openly being held in contempt by the U.S. Absolutely right, Suzanne. Thank you so much for that comment. I mean, it is open contempt. So that's what I would say. This is absolutely correct. But they like it. They like they like the contempt. That's where I would disagree, John. I'm not sure if you would necessarily agree. What do you say to that? What do you say? You're you're asking me what do I think? Yeah. What do you think about the? the do you do you? Oh do you, do well, you what think? I think what I think is this. Okay, that probably what should happen, and I think what will happen eventually is this: that um, the United States is going to uh, basically make everybody in the world a U.S. tax resident and then move to residency-based taxation where U.S. residents are excluded from paying tax, okay? And the only escape from that would be if a sovereign country wants to become a U.S. territory. They can escape from that if they, they want to become a U.S. Yeah. territory. So I think, you know, I see this as completely weaponized. Yeah. Uh, and I and I what I do think is the status quo cannot continue. I think perhaps it's an interim measure. I mean, what if the US were just to say, look, you know, I mean, we think American citizenship has to have some value. And in order for it to have value, Congress is gonna pass a law that says only the United States can tax American citizens. No other country can. So, you know, when they can have uh and this is to some extent already going on in France, right? Because of the partial exemption of investment income. You have an American citizen can probably probably go to other countries, hold up their passports and say, don't tax me. I'm American. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the, the American card Trump. But uh, the yeah, well, there's no possible way that, that this can continue the way it is. Yeah, I think so. Well, you know what? And I would say that's a great point and probably the segue for for what I kind of really wanted to talk about. Now, one of the things I've done is I've really discon disconnected myself from, from most media. I don't pay attention to the news. You know, I've long ago realized everything you're watching on screen, they somebody wants you to see that. Somebody wants you to see what's on screen because they want to impact your mind and adjust your mind. Um, and when you're saturated by so much programming, you can often lose track of what's important. So I've really checked out of things. And so one thing that happened over the weekend was the, um, the terrorist attack in Israel. I didn't learn about it until Sunday when I'm looking at tweets. Of what's going on here? And one of the first tweets I saw was intelligence failure. Intelligence failure. Well, boy, did that get me thinking. And, you know, we have some great friends in Israel and I pray for them and I hope I pray for peace in the Middle East. Uh, Mark Zell out in Israel, uh, awesome advocate for the American overseas. He's OK. Praying for his safety and everyone's safety. Three of his boys are fighting right now. No way. Oh, my. Oh, up. Three oh, of his geez. boys. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, my. Well, you know, and this is really the thing. It's that, you know. When you start looking at your government as as Johnny Utah just says, it's just like they're against us. I mean, that's that's really it. This is really, you know, the three branches of government are at war with the American people or the courts are faced with the decision. You know, right. This this is really it is. And so this is sort of where my awakening has has occurred, that I remember a huge intelligence failure in 2001. 
And it was September 11th, that huge intelligence failure. We were to believe that just at the exact time that most of the military is off on a training mission on the other side of the country, that this sophisticated plan was developed by people on satellite phones in, in Afghanistan and that it was an intelligence failure and that, oh yeah, this is why we need, the government needs to have more power. Since that day, I have come to believe that that official narrative is a lie, that the government lied to us about 9-11. I joined the families of the victims of 9-11 in, in this, that no, this was an inside job um, and the U.S. government had no problem using those 3,000 souls as props, using every all the injured as props, using all the people recovering and sacrificing everything as props. And so what I am so concerned with as, um, as we go along is that people are still believing that other people in the world really want to go to war with us. Right? Why would anyone in the world really want to go to war? That, that makes no sense. Why do any individuals really want to go in the world? Yet wars definitely happen. Wars definitely happen. When I think about this, I'm like, who in the world do I really want to go fight? Oh, nobody. Who do I want my children to go fight? Nobody. And I think about good people around the world. Who do they want to, 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 who do they want to fight? Nobody. Everybody really wants to get along. That's really the fact. No matter what, call it country, creed, meet people all over the world. We all just want to get along. But yet we're not. Um, I've met people from, I met Palestinians. I met, I met Israelis. They actually want to get along, but they're not getting along. So the thing that I would want to just, you know, I think that we all should be taking a look at is who benefits? These are the questions we need to ask is who benefits? Who benefits when Israel is, has an intelligence failure um, that allows this to happen? And who benefits when this intelligence failure is captured on video and is disseminated all across the world? Um, who benefits? And now, and as we go through, is who benefits with more? That's really the question. Who benefits because this tax is upheld? Um, and that's the question. And this, this, is, this is my point. If you have not been convinced that the United States, you know, maybe 9-11, maybe you're still on, maybe you're still on board. Maybe you're still on board, like, Anthony, you're out of your mind. Those flag, false flags didn't occur. The, we don't even know what the term false flag ex, ex, means. Okay, fine. Well, can't you see that with our task code, the United States government is clearly against its own people? That, that is my point. That is my point, and that is my question for everybody. We don't need to look at anything else. We could look just at the task code to say, this government can't stand us and it wants to rule over us and it wants to do anything it, it, it wants to us. It wants to own us. It wants to send us to wars we don't want to fight. It wants to send our money to wars we don't want to fight. It is truly against us. And so that is, I want to, I want, I want to see if Keith can answer this question. Keith, are you convinced just based on the U.S. tax code alone, how it's being enforced as an American overseas and helping out people around the world? Are you convinced the top enemy of the American people is the U.S. government? I, I will put it this way, is that I am convinced that for Americans overseas and the other associated affected populations, vis-a-vis -vis the extraterritoriality of the U.S. tax code, the U.S. is the enemy because they continue and I... I'm almost um, a little hesitant to word, use the word right at this moment, terrorize, just because of what's happening in Israel. Yeah, right. But, exactly. I, but I, I will use it, but knowing that it's quite different than what's going on in Israel. But I am convinced that the U.S. is terrorizing All the right. American immigrants, accidental Americans, green card holders living overseas in any of the other associated affected populations. I am, and I don't say that lightly, because I've been- I know, you know Keith. I've been doing this for a number of years, and there are a lot of forces out there that are against Americans overseas, even though they may say that they are for them, because you have to look at their actions or their non-actions. So that's my view on it. Wow. Wow. And just folks, I, I, I'm, I'm, um, this, and this, I hate to say it, don't get you me know, wrong. I don't like saying what I just said, 
because keep... it goes against anything, everything that I grew up to believe that it makes me question everything as a result, which I think is a good thing in the long term, but wow. it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable wow. saying that. Wow. Voila. Yeah. Um, you know, Keith, that, um, you know, Keith, Keith and I don't, don't agree hundred percent politically and I'm a little bit more of a, you know, uh, I'm a little bit out there. I, I understand that. Um, and so to have this agreement on this, I think is incredible. And I think it's, it's, it's actually very, it's very helpful, um, for us, uh, that, that, that's really it. When people start realizing, you know, wait a second, this tax code, you really can't stand us. You, you know, you, we really are your enemy. That's when you know, we might get some progress. We're like, wait a second, you are the top enemy. It's not someone else around the world. It's, it's, it's not, it's not Vladimir Putin. He's not, you know, Vladimir Putin didn't take any of my money. The, you know, he didn't, he didn't seize any of my money. He's not requiring me to file an F bar. And if I don't file an F bar that I'll be, you know, taxed. He, he hasn't done any of that. Um, no matter what, I can't think of anyone around the world who's done more harm to Americans than our own government. And, and, and I challenge anybody. I challenge anybody to find anybody who's harmed the American people as much as our own government has. Um, I see Keith had to drop out there. Um, John, same thing. Are you convinced uh, just through tax code alone that the, the United States government is the top enemy of the American people? Oh, absolutely. The tax code is the way the government expresses its hatred for individual Americans. Yeah. How can that not be true? That is, we know uh, it's, true. it's very obviously true. It's, it is so true. And that is the, uh, absolutely, you know, and you know, okay. Thank you, Suzanne. Right. And, and we don't want to go too dramatic, but this is absolutely correct. After dealing with back, et cetera, there has been times I felt suicidal that there was no one that cared in government and you're just trapped in no man's land until you renounce and that may change. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's the, the government's driving you to be suicidal. And I've seen people actually, I have gotten a suicide note faxed to me uh, from a wife, um, and it is wow. it is absolutely true. People, this is this is. Yeah. A, a I've had people cry. Make... I've had people cry to me on the phone, and I'm not exaggerating. When I've been trying to help them, and they're crying because they don't know what to do or where to turn, and it's affecting them emotionally. Absolutely. Ergo, it also affects their family as a right? result. Because it's financial terrorism. Because that's called terrorism, and that's what yeah. we have. And yet. Go ahead, John. Let me give you, a, me give you a, uh, uh, although not disagreeing with anything anybody is saying, a somewhat more neutral, objective way to put this, okay? Um, you know, over the last few years, I've been thinking more and more about, you know, what does freedom really mean, you know, et cetera. You know, as, as you know, we see these governments all around the world kind of closing in on people, you know, from an economic perspective. and I think that uh, freedom uh, largely includes the time and the opportunity to be able to think about things, uh, you know, to plan, to evaluate, you know, with sort of a calm, deliberative state of mind. And what's happened with the U.S. tax system and the general regulatory regime, which is so vast, is that American citizens just have to spend an ungodly percentage of their life thinking about compliance rules. You know, I don't know that I'd use the word terror, but I'm not disagreeing with it either. But worrying about compliance, penalties, fines, etc. In a way that it's very, very clear that citizens of no other country, there's not, there's not even a close second, right? And, you know, so the people who have money... Uh, or expertise or something or a certain emotional DNA are able to remove themselves from that by, you know, paying somebody saying, you know, here, I want you to deal with this problem for, for me or whatever. But the vast majority of people can't do that. So what an American citizen is in the 21st century is a carbon life form who's just, you know, dealing with an ungodly weight of rules, regulations, threats, etc., of such a vast and weighty cumulative nature that rather than thinking about important things that may have something to do with moving forward in life or human progress generally, what do they think about? Like right now, today is the 10th of October. 
Think of how many people the last five days before the tax filing deadline, okay, are just immersed in stuff that, from the point of view of the citizen of any other country, is just indescribable bullshit. Do I have to file this form? Do I have to file that form? If so, what exchange rate do I reuse? Oh, my God, I can't figure it out. And I don't have confidence in my compliance person either, right? So you see, another way of looking at American citizenship in the 21st century would be carbon life forms who are provided the opportunity to think. In other words, it's just it's this constant reaction based on, uh, you know, was it somebody once said a blizzard of forms or, you know, just obligations that are are so massive, so intrusive so difficult to understand and so impossible to comply with, right? That this is what they this is what American thinks about it, filling out forms. Citizens of other oh, yeah. countries, their lives aren't perfect, but they don't think about, you know, um pay fix and you, you know, you're reminding me what I have to do the rest of the you know the rest of the few days. Um exactly like oh this is what the rest of my week is gonna be like. I'm enjoying my 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 quick break this morning uh doing this podcast. But exactly the, the questions that you know, getting from people to panic is like, ah, oh, it's, it's not right. They're going to come for me. And, you know, the weird questions, uh, just bizarre, bizarre. And I mean, just be complications beyond. Um, it, it is uh, really something. So, uh, yeah. And then celebration. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> It keeps, it keeps well, people so busy that they can't vote these people out of office effectively. Yeah. Huh? Right, we can't get organized because we're too busy trying to uh, bail water out of the. But, but you see, ship. this is the difference, right, between everyday people and the people who have a chance of being free. Is the only way you're gonna have a chance of being free as an American citizen is if you can find a way to not think about this stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The weight, it, the you know, the weight it carries on you. And it's really, you know, you're, you're the best time of the year is right after you file your tax return because that's the most amount of time you have until you have to think about it again. Well, it's even um, worse than that because, and I've been guilty of this myself, you know, I have a lot to do and I clean up a bunch of, you know, sort of regulatory things in my life, whatever they may be, whether it's bill paying or this or, you know, and I do all this stuff and I, all of a sudden I have this feeling of, 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 oh my God, I look at how much I just got done. But then I realize. John, you didn't do a damn thing of value. You just waste a bunch of time, you know, complying with obligations, living in a first world democracy in the 21st century. Yeah, you'd be better off living in a third world country on a farm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I often think of that. All right, well, it's time to wrap up here. I just want to, I want to, you know, and, and I just say one concluding remark, and maybe we'll end just on this, is that, you know, um, somebody in the past, they just couldn't kill. There was somebody... You know, they just didn't want to execute. And I would say this is sort of just sort of make me think of this, that Jesus Christ, they just couldn't execute. They couldn't do that. But no, 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 no. They need, needed to humiliate him and make him carry his cross. Likewise, although it's different, they just can't give us an awful tax bill that ruins us. They must make us carry our own compliance costs in the form of filing. The thing that oh, we yeah. get to do to... To, to, to suffer and dwell upon and be humiliated over, look at that person over there. They owe something. They are not doing it right. And all that humiliation that comes across. And then the government is kindly, kindly nails us upon us that uh, cross. And there we go. Yeah. Well, you know, and Jesus left. carried his cross and modern day Americans pay their compliance fees. There it is. <laughs> well, that, well, it's true, isn't it? Yeah, it's the cross to bear. That's, yeah. That is our cross to bear as Americans. It sure seems that way. Well, hey, so I th thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you for the comments. We had a great audience live. And just be sure, and I would say this again, I know we're, we're, we're picking up a lot of subscribers now, and I know a lot of subscribers are joining in and able to participate. So be sure to subscribe and turn on the notifications so you know when we're going live. We do like to post ahead of time, but we can't get it to all the time. And sometimes hot topics come up and we want to hit them right away. So be sure to turn on those notifications. Um, and the other thing, too, is I think we have our topic for next week. Uh, John, I'd really love to talk about Cook versus Tate as the basis of um, you know, uh, of the United States government. I wrote a blog post I wrote about a year ago. I'll send it over. And By the way, uh, you know, the fact that I wrote it certainly doesn't make it true. It was my interpretation of this. And obviously, you know, I think it could be a very, very good discussion, uh, you know, with people listening in as well. I'm not claiming I'm right. But, you know, for those who know me, I think I'm right.
All right. All right, folks. And so if you're looking to, to reach out to John, his email is citizenship solutions at protonmail.com. If you're thinking about uh, upgrading uh, your life and getting rid of your renouncing your citizenship, John could really help you out. Also want to get your key information. If you are a global citizen trying to figure out what you should do, you're not in compliance and you're wondering if you should get into compliance, but you're not sure if you know, your best start might not be calling a tax advisory firm. I'm one myself. That might not be your best move. Your best move may be reaching out to Keith. Here's his email, us underscore overseas underscore advocate at outlook.com. He can give you some advice about what people are doing around the world to uh, deal with the threat that the United States government poses to their well-being. Um, so reach out to him. And then also myself. Um, and I'm just going to put this out here because I know this is I know people are going to be watching this. Uh, they're probably not watching it now. Tax pros are probably uh, busy tax preparing. Uh, but we're hiring. Um, so if you are a tax pro, uh, reach out to me uh, if you would like to work for a firm that thinks the United States government isn't the hero in the story. Uh, please send me your email. Uh, we're looking for preparers, also fellow attorneys, uh, uh, other anyone else looking for truth, justice, helping out the actual American people. See, see, please email a parents at IRS Medic. You, you mean truth, justice, and the un-American way? There, there you go. Right, the currently un-American way of not, <laughs> not, uh, not thinking that the yeah, our, the Constitution should be the U.S. tax code. So with that, this is Anthony Parent of Iris Medic. I thank everybody for watching. I thank all the com uh, comments. Thank you, everybody, so much. Great to have you.